I heard about this funeral director who had a planning a funeral for a guy, a graveside service, and he contacted the person who played the bagpipes. So we're going to have a graveside service for this guy. He's a homeless guy. There'll probably be nobody there, but I want to honor him because I knew him and we'll play the bagpipes. So the guy said, okay, I'll come. I'll do that. Uh, the guy got to where he thought the place was, but there was no hearse around. I said, I must have missed it. And he looked over, and there was this hole, and there was this dirt. He said, that must be the grave. So he goes over, takes out his bagpipes. Now, there were some men working over in the distance, and this guy started playing with all his heart, Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. I don't know anything more beautiful than playing Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. And these men came over, and the, they were weeping, and after he finished playing, he was tired, and one man said, that's the first time I've ever seen bagpipes played over a septic tank. <laughs> Sometimes the things you're, you think you're going to do, you end up with surprises, and I have really ended up with a surprise in preparing for you, for me. Uh, Chuck, the last three weeks have been tough for me because I've been wrestling with God as He has spoken to me about my own life. Because uh, one of the things I, I was thinking about is you men really want to be a men who make a difference, don't you? Yes. And, and so what I did, I went to Nehemiah in the Old Testament. He's probably one of the greatest difference makers in the Old Testament. He was not a prophet. He was not a priest. He was not a king. He was just a layman. And, and I want to, to, you to turn, if you got a Bible, there have a few Bibles here I can say to Nehemiah 1. There's always something good when you look at God's Word that comes to you differently than just when you hear it. So the physical seeing the Word of God, and what I want to do is sort of share with you how God spoke directly to me as I looked at this first chapter of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah gets this word that his people were desolate. They were in great distress. The gates and walls were burned down. Now this was significant and a tragedy for the people who lived there. You see, walls were a sign of strength. They were a sign of God's protection. And now they were gone. And this was a sign to the Israelites that, that making them feel weak and inferior and as though God had deserted them. And unbelievers would walk by and mock them. Where's your God now? Ha! Where is He, you weak people? And to make matters worse, no one really seemed to care. Apathy had set in. Indifference ruled the day. No one seemed to be bothered by their lousy condition. The once proud people of God who walked with God were now in spiritual disarray. They no longer sensed the joy and the presence and the power of God. Now look at how Nehemiah responded. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. When Nehemiah learned of their plight, to him the name of God was being dishonored. The holiness and greatness of God was being ridiculed. His people were lost and humiliated. His heart was broken over the condition of his people. And he sat down and he wept. He was grieving. What broke God's heart broke Nehemiah's heart. What mattered to God mattered to Nehemiah. The Holy Spirit led me, I believe, to focus on the most important truth once you become a Christian. The most important truth is to become a Christian. This is the next most important truth that we really need to hear once we're a Christian. And it is something to cry over. And this evening, I'm just going to share with you how I sense God speaking to me. And I want you to know this is the truth that I needed spoken into my life. And what's more, 
Chances are you really need this truth, and I know our churches need this truth. God knows we need this truth. We've always needed this truth, but we need it more than ever. When I asked the Lord this question, uh, it was though as the Holy Spirit asked me a question. It's like He said, John, why did I send my Son into the world to die that gruesome death on the cross to rise again? Why did I do that? Then all of a sudden I get these verses that come to mind. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Then the words of Jesus in Luke 19, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Now we begin to see something in God's heart, don't we? And then Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This means all people everywhere. And then in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to be lost, but He wants everyone to come to repentance. This means He wants them to stop living the way they're living, and we need people in church to do this too, and that is to repent and throw their heart and life to follow Jesus. One of the problems we have in the church is people say, I believe, but they never repented. Right. They're living the way of the world. They never repented. And the, the greatest thing that can happen to us is we never repent of our sins because we never acknowledge them. God wants everyone to come to know Him. He doesn't want anyone to perish. That means He, he wants every person in Ashburn, in Randolph County, in North Carolina, in America, around the world, in Afghanistan, in Iran, Iraq. He wants all people everywhere to come to know Him. And I thought, well, if, if this is what breaks God's heart, what is it then that brings God great joy? If lostness breaks God's heart, what fills his heart with joy? And uh, that's when the parables in Luke 15 came to mind. You know, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Uh, what happens, he said, when the lost sheep was found, he said, I tell you, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And basically the same thing was said in the lost coin. Everybody is going to live eternally with God or without God. That's everybody in your family, everybody in your neighborhood, everybody you work with, everybody in Randolph County. Everybody is going to live eternally. But it's either going to be with God or without God. And if you read the Bible about what it says about living eternally without God, your heart ought to cringe. We shouldn't even want our worst enemy there. And I was thinking of this. I recall something I read General Booth said to his lieutenants one day. You know, General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, I wish all of you could spend two weeks in hell to see and experience the pain and the anguish of all assigned to live there through eternity, then maybe, maybe that experience will awaken you to the reality of lostness and move you to compassion and an action to tell others about Jesus. And here's what God spoke to me. John, your heart is not broken for lost people. Now, I spent my lifetime trying to tell people about Jesus and get other people to tell about Jesus. But God was right. My heart was not broken over lost people as evidenced by my inaction and my indifference. Furthermore, the 
church, he forced me to see that the church in general in America has the same problem. Lost people no longer move them. They have become complacent and indifferent. They have grown to sleep at the wheel. You know what terrible happens if you drive along? People don't know they go to sleep when they go to sleep and they have a big accident. And we have gone to sleep at the wheel, not caring for the main thing that Jesus cares about. Amen. Is that true for you? For your church? You know, lost people just don't really break our hearts. And boy, did this just sort of hurt. And this is why I've been uncomfortable. While I believe it's important for lost people to be told about Jesus, yet there were no actions in my life to demonstrate what I believe. And I've said a long time, what we, what we do is what we really believe. Do you have some actions in your life that showing that you're concerned for lost people? Or you just say, I believe about this. Furthermore, he pointed out to me that the church in general had given up on praying for lost people. Is that true? In your prayer time, are you praying for a lost person? Maybe you are. I discover most people aren't. Uh, is it true in your Bible study group, your Sunday school class, that, that you know what I hear church people pray for most? Illness, sickness. Listen, the sick of the sickest is a lost person. Do lost people have a priority in your life? I, I just think, put it this way, we're all going to die and a sick Christian dies. They go to heaven and get a new body. That's good news. Isn't it? But the sickest of the sick, a lost person, when they die, they go to hell and their pain and anguish continues throughout eternity. Then it digs a little deeper in verse 5. O Lord and God of heaven, the great, awesome God who keeps His covenant of His love with those who love Him and obey His commands. Nehemiah reveals three things about God here. You're great. That's God's position. You're awesome. That's God's power. You keep your promises. That's God's covenant. This reminds us that God is more powerful than anything we can ever face. Anything that stands against Him and us. He is a God who keeps His promises. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you really believe that? Yes. Well, as I ponder these things, here's what the Holy Spirit is strange. He said, John, it's your job just simply to tell other people about Jesus. It's my job to convict them. You don't have to worry about that. Your job is just to tell your story, share the witness, leave the rest to me. I said, well, Lord, what keeps us from telling another person about Jesus? We're fearful. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to offend. We don't think we can make an impact. We fear of failure. We think it's somebody else's responsibility. We think, well, you know, I just don't know how. And I realize when we say things like that, we're actually saying we don't believe in the power of God. For instance, Acts 8.1. Persecution came to the Christians in Jerusalem. And all the people who have been there at Pentecost scattered throughout the land except the apostles. The ones who spent three years with Jesus. They stayed in Jerusalem. You know who started that early church? Lay people who just had a real encounter with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And they went and told others about it. I tell you, we think it has to be a preacher. Listen, everybody is a preacher. Which means to proclaim, to share the good news. We have put everything in the church instead of out into the world. And I just think... Wow. And I continued. Verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servant, the people of Israel. Nehemiah had been praying night and day for four months. At the heart of Nehemiah being a difference maker, he kept praying until he got God's answer. And, and as I contemplated this, the Holy Spirit reminded me that I was not to give up on praying for other people, but to keep on praying. And boy,
boy, have I been guilty of giving up on other people. Have you? You see, you want revival. And I want revival. The revival doesn't start out there. It starts with John Rogers. It starts with you. You remember the great scripture we often use, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Who, who, who if my people? That's us. We're His people. And we seek His face and we turn from our wicked ways. And He will hear from heaven. And He'll love me. We've got to stop pointing the finger out there and we've got to start here. And I, I want Him to use me to make a difference. And I want my heart. I, I can't say it's, it's there where I think God wants it to be for lost people. Because I can't remember when I cried over a lost person and kept taking them to the throne of grace. So that's where I am. Where are you?